Why is it so important to learn about this way of thinking? Well, first of all, our our preconceived notions about politics and ideologies really need to be challenged at this point. I don't think I need to say that they become more of a problem than a solution. And classical conservative thought is out of the box at this point in time. And so it's kind of a curative thing <laughs> to try to understand and uh, to a certain extent to try to apply it. It deals with practical matters. And one of my biggest pet peeves in the theory world is that there's a lot of people who just like theory for mental gymnastics and juggling ideas. And that's not why I'm in it. And that's not why anybody should be in it. You should be in it if you can use it to solve problems. And classical conservative thinking is about solving problems. And because of that, it's not maybe as sexy as, you know, the latest theory trend or whatever. But frankly, if that's what you're after, then go find something else to do because political theory should be about and is about when it's at its best about solving human problems. And classical conservative thinking is all about that. Um, as I say there, it provides a tendency and a way of thinking that transcends ideologies. And, and don't we need that now? So if this is new to you, just try to hang in there because typically when we hear the term conservative, um, at least in the United States, it comes along with a very different connotations. Like this is the book that I've used for so long. It's edited by Pocock. And in the introduction, which Pocock writes, he says, we do not mean what is meant by the word in the contemporary United States, which is in the U.S. sense, it's a blend of American patriotism, evangelical religion, and free enterprise values. That's not what this kind of conservatism is about. This is an older kind. And then he goes on to say, Burke's conservatism is part of the history of philosophical conservatism. And we shall see in greater detail as we study this text that this is based on the claim that human beings acting in politics always start from within a historically determined context and that it's morally as well as practically important to remember that they're not absolutely free to wipe away this context. So it's historically informed and because of that it's flexible. What works in one area at one particular time from the classical conservative perspective may not and probably will not work in another. So it's not a one size fits all way of thinking and that distinguishes it from contemporary US conservatism, which is really a form of right wing um, liberalism. So, um, you know, Burke was Irish, which makes him kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, so, you know, like he came from Ireland, he moved to England to further his career, but he came from poor to middle class uh, background. His mother was definitely from the poorer class and she was an Irish Catholic. His dad was an Irish Protestant and he was a solicitor or a kind of lawyer, okay? But neither one of them were members of the aristocracy. So Burke was not a member of the aristocracy. And that meant to the extent that he rose in this world, it was due to his own genius and his own hard work and ingenuity. And he made the very most of that. And uh, he became a member of the Whig party in, in England. The Whig party was the party that was not for absolute monarchy or you know the supremacy of the English monarch. It was the party that had backed the glorious revolution of 1688, which ushered in a mixed form of government and reigned in the powers of the monarch and elevated the, the parliament's supremacy. So Burke was not a Tory, in other words, he wasn't a a traditionalist to that extent of supporting the English monarchy as supreme. It was the more, you know, using our terms, the more progressive party. And you might wonder, well, why? Why is he now considered a traditionalist or a conservative? Well, we'll get to that. Um, he was a combination of the product of his own work in writing, and in um, more or less giving services uh, to people in the way of editorial work, 
um, as well as analysis. And also as a result of that, he was a product of aristocratic patronage, the Rockingham family, the uh, major Whig influence in England, um, supported Burke in many ways. And so Burke rose partly due to his own hard work and partly due to the fact that that work gained him attention and gave him a patron, um, a wealthy aristocratic family that, that supported him. Um, and so, you know, that experience shaped his entire worldview. He understood that the aristocracy was limited because just because you were born of noble birth didn't mean that you would be productive or that you would be particularly smart. He understood that because of his own personal experience. However, he also understood that the aristocracy could be a source of support for the intellectual life and that perhaps the, the growing bourgeois class was not as interested in that generally or as supportive because their focus was more narrow. It was on making money, which Burke was not terribly interested in, in doing, as we'll find out. Um, so uh, he also had political experience of a practical nature. He was a member of parliament for several years for Bristol. Um, and then he obtained a pocket borough, which means a borough was basically uh, a position in parliament that was given to him because of the, the family that controlled the area basically allowed Burke to represent the area. So he was involved in Parliament, and as far as religion goes, he respected it deeply. Um, as I said, his mother was a Catholic, his father was a Protestant, he was a member of the Church of Ireland, and he was a great supporter of the Church of England as an institution. So in effect, he was a type of Protestant. Um, so Burke was known for his highly emotional rants in Parliament uh, with a very strong and sometimes indecipherable Irish accent. He would go on and on. He was often uh, known for being highly emotional, uh, sometimes haranguing people, definitely shouting, um, and just going on at great length, which would empty out the chamber apparently. Or, I mean, Google MPs asleep and you will see that um, MPs, members of parliament, are, are kind of notorious for falling asleep during uh, <laughs> long speeches. I bet you anything that Edmund Burke put a few people to sleep. But at the same time, from what I can tell and from what I've read, if you read the transcripts, if you, if you actually read what Burke wrote, he, his ability to make a good speech was, was, was fine, you know? Um, and he was actually a master of the language. If you read this book along with me, you'll see that uh, Burke is capable of a great turn of phrase. But yes, he could go on and on. And so he was not always the most popular guy. And he often took controversial stances. And, uh, you know, so for that reason, didn't make him, it didn't always make him uh, adorable to everybody, <laughs> everybody there. Um, now, the one that really stands out, a stance that really didn't make him popular with his own party, um, was his opposition to the French Revolution. He'd sort of been on the fence about the American Revolution. He supported the, the revolutionaries' claims of being more or less um, disenfranchised by the English. And he thought that the way that England should go is to basically make amends with these colonists, make sure they were represented and taken care of to avoid a revolution. When the revolution in America happened, however, he stepped back and didn't, didn't say anything, which was the first indication that Burke and revolution of the type that's violent anyway, you know, do, did not mix. In this book, uh, the, the Reflections on the Revolution in France, he makes a distinction between the glorious revolution of 1688 and the French Revolution. The glorious revolution was, a, you know, more or less, I mean, I'm sure there was some violence somewhere, but more or less a peaceful transition that Burke treats as staying within the zone of the original framework of the, uh, of the English Constitution. Um, that just kind of uh, switched up monarchs so that uh, Catholicism um, wouldn't, wouldn't take over England. Again, we'll talk more about that, but um, 
But, you know, the French Revolution he saw as like extremely radical, a break from uh, the French position. And he felt that there were a lot of Whigs, and he was right, there were a lot of Whigs um, of people of his party who admired the French Revolution too much. And apparently he didn't think they saw the radicalism and the danger in it. And so, you know, he took a stance that was opposed more and more to his own party's position. So, you know, the way Burke felt was that his party was leaving him behind, that it was shifting from the type of party that he knew and supported to one that would actually support this really radical, crazy, uh, re revolutionary stance um, that in France. Um, but he did not leave his party over it. Instead, he continued to try to persuade and educate and warn them. And this earned him a lot of animosity. Okay, they didn't like it. Um, one of his friends, Fox in particular, uh, was, was upset. He wrote this book, An Appeal from the New to the Old Whigs, um, as a way of trying to like explain to his Whig buddies uh, why it is they should change their mind and that uh, their positions were not very Whiggish, okay? Which brings me to this friendship with Charles James Fox, okay? Fox was also a supporter and a patron of Burke, but they really split up. They had a sort of bromance going on, and then they split up over Burke's opinion of the French Revolution because Fox just got more and more radical about it as time went by, apparently. And the cool thing about Fox is he's sort of a Falstaff-type figure um, in English history. You can see there he had these amazing eyebrows, and in fact he was known as the Eyebrow. And he was this very portly man whose life was just like large, like he, he lived outside the box entirely in his personal life, you know. He would drink a lot, he partied all the time, and um, he was known as a womanizer, you know, he had affairs, he eventually uh, married a woman that was kind of like considered, you know, un improper, and he kept the marriage secret for years, while enjoying her company the whole time. He was just an outsized individual in every way. And apparently, Edmund Burke and him got along famously. Um, he was fun, you know. Uh, I don't know if Burke did this, but Fox was a gambler as well. And, you know, so I'm sure that Burke at least enjoyed many a party and a great conversation with Charles James Fox. However, when it came to their argument about the French Revolution, apparently one or both of them like got all teary-eyed as they like reached the point of irreconcil irreconcilable differences and literally broke up in a session of Parliament. Or at least this is what I read. And that at least Charles Fox was literally crying um, about this split because they liked each other so much. <laughs> and so, I mean, this kind of, again, it reminds me of the relationship between Henry IV and Falstaff. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm telling you right now, you need to watch um, Henry IV parts one and two and pay attention to the relationship between Hal, Prince Henry, and Falstaff and how at a certain point in part two, um, Henry has to say goodbye to this this larger than life, party hard, absolutely dissolute, uh, wonderful man with with a low sort of like a low character on some ends of the spectrum, but also like loyalty to a certain extent, but not completely. You know, in other words, Falstaff is a mixed character with plenty of bad but also very lovable and a good friend for Hal. And Hal used his company for a long time as a form of entertainment. But there came this point where he had to lead and then literally Hal had to disown him and said, more or less, we can't be friends anymore. I can't talk to you anymore. Um, and something similar happened here with Burke, who felt so strongly about not going down the revolutionary path that he let this friendship go in the most dramatic way possible. So what was it about the French Revolution and the way that Burke thought 
that led him to break up this famous friendship and put him at odds with so many other people. Why did he become so stubborn? Well, this is what I hope to be able to explain, and I'm gonna move through some of the chief points of the reflections on the revolution in France. And you can tell, I have read this a lot. This is my copy that I've been using for years in class. Um, and as you can see, um, it's actually in two pieces at this point. Uh, so I have taught this many times. Uh, I've read it many times and uh, hopefully hang in there. You know, if you're somewhat suspicious because you watch me because you don't like contemporary conservatives, you may be a little bit suspicious, but I think that you've got something to learn. Hang in there and check this out because it can help us to become more practical.